Hey, right, we're live. So okay. people kind of slowly, I think, joining in. Um, so we can give a couple of minutes. Okay, just um, you can either like shoot me a message or just give me the go ahead and I'll start talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to those um, who joined already. Um, we're just going to give a few minutes to let people um, slowly trickle in and then I'll give an introduction. But thank you so much for tuning into this webinar. <laughs> Aww. Simone, I think that um, people are just kind of trickling in, so you can get started whenever you feel ready. Okay, sounds great. Um, hi, everyone. I am Simone Ijoma. I'm the Workplace Justice Fellow at the National Women's Law Center. Um, thank you for joining the National Women's Law Center and the Times Up Legal Defense Fund for On the Basis of Sex and Race, representing Black women survivors of workplace sex harassment and sexual violence. In the Law Center's policy work, litigation, and other advocacy, we are committed to centering the experiences of marginalized communities, particularly Black and Brown women and girls. By centering the experiences of these communities, though they may vary, it is not just Black women who benefit, but all women. At the Times of Legal Defense Fund, where more than 16% of the people who come to us requesting legal help are Black and nearly 40% are women of color, it's critically important that the attorneys who collaborate with us through the Legal Network for Gender Equity understand the many ways in which sexual violence impacts Black women and how we can most effectively support and, and advocate for Black women survivors. Thank you to the attorneys who volunteer for the Legal Network for Gender Equity for being committed to combating sex discrimination, including sexual harassment, and for taking the time to listen, learn, and share space with us today. Our hope is that attorneys and other advocates can walk away from this conversation with the historical context and practical knowledge to better serve their clients, especially Black women survivors. I will not spend time going through the many accomplishments of our esteemed panelists. If you have not reviewed the speaker list and biographies, I invite you to review those materials now or at your leisure. We will have time for questions from the audience at the end of the webinar. During the presentations, please keep your devices on mute. You may send questions and comments by using the chat function on the right of your screens. If your question is not asked during the moderated discussion, we will do our best to address your questions at the end during the Q&A portion. Um, so let's get started. Yvette, I'd like to start with you. Over the last several years, intersectionality has become somewhat of a buzzword, especially in progressive and feminist spaces. Can you talk to us a little bit about intersectionality as a legal concept and what it is and what it is not? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I guess I'll just, just panelists can give me a thumbs up. Great. Um, so intersectionality uh, seems to be sort of a loaded uh, term. Um, it was coined by the brilliant Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. Um, sorry to say, but I was not born, but <laughs> I was born shortly after. <laughs> shortly after she coined the term and I've come to learn a lot about it because it's something that I focus um, a lot of my writing on. And so, like Simone said, it's a term that is thrown around quite a lot and some consider it to be a loaded, convoluted, confusing term, but it really is a simple concept and it does not take, to me, in my opinion, it doesn't take years of studying critical race theory like Ms. Crenshaw did to understand it or to apply it. Uh, next slide. 
I think Anna's working on it. All right, so I wrote a little funny article. Um, this is not the title of the article, but I tend <laughs> to use this as the title of my presentation because it sums it up pretty easily, right? So my article <laughs> is the long shortcomings, Black women, et cetera. But really, it boils down to why I think Title VII sucks and, and what I think we can do to fix it. Um, so next slide. And I'm not going to get too deep into what I actually wrote about, but I will talk about some of the solutions that I proposed and then um, and, and kind of talk a little bit about intersectionality generally. So um, obviously intersectionality is a framework um, for conceptualizing a person by their identities, plural on the identities. A lot of what we do in the world is see someone in a singular sort of lens. Right, so if we see a white person, that person is just white. We don't know anything else, and all we see is what what they look like. If we see somebody who um, is white who may be disabled, but you have no idea that they're disabled. You wouldn't be able to know that unless you tune mind into thinking about that person and their multiple identities. Uh, next slide. So, if we were to see intersectionality in action. Uh, this was probably the best metaphor that I could come up with, but essentially it would look like someone looking through a prism and here the prism would be the person and seeing a white light hit just at the right angle to show the dispersion or the separation of the layers of the white light, which as we see here comprises several colors, the red, the orange, the yellow, the green, the blue, and the violet. The idea of applying an intersectional lens is very similar to this concept. Um, and it's actually mostly exact in my mind because it's like looking through a prism of a person where if an individual plaintiff files an anti-discrimination action, like a Title VII action, this exercise of looking at the individual through this prism and seeing that individual's separate identities, which would represent the colors. If you were to look at a prism, all you would see is a clear glass prism. Okay, nice shape, looks cool. But if you look at the reflection of the white light through the prism, you see that the white light isn't just some white light, it's actually a reflection of many different colors layered together. And that's the simplest way that I can explain intersectionality to someone who doesn't have time to, to spend reading Crenshaw and all of these critical race theories. Um, and according to Crenshaw, intersectionality was meant to draw attention to the way specifically that black women's experiences, sometimes distinct experiences of gender discrimination was buried under the experiences of white women and black men's experiences. It's sometimes hard to separate because as a black woman, you are black and you are a woman. And some people see it as, okay, you're black woman, but you're black. So I'm just gonna look at all your problems through that lens. Others see it as you're a black woman, you're a woman. So I'm gonna look at all your problems through that lens. The problem with that is that the specific issue that the black woman is facing isn't separated. There's a reason that the black woman is a black woman and not just a black person or a woman. It's about how the structures make these identities as both a black and a female work together. And they expose that vulnerability of that person to whomever is looking at it. So put simply, intersectionality is the acknowledgement that a person's identity overlaps and therefore experiences oppression based on the intersection of those overlapping identities. A black rich woman experiences life and interacts with the law differently than a black poor woman. But they're both black women. So if you look at it from the lens of just studying somebody because of what they look like, a prism or a white light, you're going to miss that nuance in being able to enforce the law or to give them the justice that they're seeking. Next slide, please. So this is sort of the, the popular sort of wheel of intersectionality. And I'm sure that there are other 
identities that we could all come up with, but these are the ones that tend to come up a lot. And so similar to the prism idea, when you look through it, when you look through somebody, you can see all of these things, their gender, their disability, their geography, their culture. I'm a black woman, but I'm an African woman. I was born in Ghana. My experience could be completely different than a black woman who was born in America. I'm an African woman who is not a US citizen. That's another layer. I'm African, I'm, I identify as black, I'm a woman, I'm also Christian, and I'm a lawyer, which means I have an advanced degree. We're already at five identities and you don't know anything about me, right? And so it's important when you are considering how the law interacts with people to understand that there are multiple layers that lawmakers and, and people who are effectuating justice need to understand. Now, my paper was specifically in the context of employment. And though the concept of intersectionality was born out of a desire to study Black women's experiences, it's been employed as a framework for studying a multitude of minority groups that experience employment discrimination. Next slide, please. So one of those examples, and I've given you the practical prism ex example so you understand what intersectionality is, and now I'm gonna give you how it plays out in the law. Um, so the Montes versus Greater Twin Cities Youth Symphonies case is a really good one for me. And I have many of these, but I'm only gonna focus on this one because I don't have that much time. But essentially Montez um, is a black Haitian American plaintiff. And there's a reason I put black Haitian American because if I had put just a black man, we wouldn't really be talking about what we're talking about here. But he brought a case against his employer for race and national origin discrimination. As you know, race and national origin are two of the protected categories in Title VII. And the reason that he brought the case for race and national origin is because he had some experiences at work that led him to believe that he was being discriminated not only because he was a black man, but because he was black and Haitian American. Next slide, please. In support of his claims, he cited several examples of actions and statements made to him during his tenure. One of the comments involved board members telling him that he needed to be integrated into the community as an African-American. The board attempted to form a committee that would help him assimilate and a subcommittee to address how soft-spoken he was and to address his accent, which according to them was difficult to understand. He testified that he perceived the attempt to form a committee to help him assimilate to be discriminatory. And a board member testified that she found this suggestion by the board to be inappropriate. Another example was the use of the phrase, la bête noire. Next slide, so you can actually see the language. Oh, it's right there. La bête noire, which is a French saying to describe and refer to our plaintiff. The direct translation of la bête noire is the black beast. That's the French phrase's literal meaning. And it's been incorporated into the English language as a phrase that means one that is particularly disliked or that is to be avoided. I would think if you saw a black beast, you would dislike it or try to avoid it. When the court looked at the evidence, using the McDonnell Douglas framework, the court said, yeah, that sounds interesting, but the plaintiff hasn't really given us any evidence to show that his race or national origin was the factor behind the employment decision. I've highlighted some words here in the court's actual ruling. And the court made a decision that none of the evidence provided invinced discrimination 
and that no reasonable jury could conclude that the evidence, even the sliver of evidence that I gave you indicated that he was terminated because of his race or national origin. Under this framework, it's a very popular framework and I'm sure that we'll hear more about it. He was unable to defeat the employer's motion for summary judgment. They didn't see it because to them, it didn't seem like he was being discriminated on his race or national origin. My question after reading it is how is it possible that a suggestion literally based on a person's race and national origin does not evince discrimination? Why form a committee to try to get somebody to assimilate to uh, an identity that you've chosen for them? I'm sure that this would not have been suggested to a person who were a white American. They wouldn't have to create a committee. They wouldn't have to talk about his soft-spokenness. And they certainly wouldn't call him La Bette Noir, which literally means the Black Beast. But because he was unable to prove so specifically that they had either fired Black people or fired Haitian Americans, they could not find enough evidence to show that he was discriminated on both of those grounds. Next slide. So I've highlighted the relevant text of Title VII and, and my entire article basically collapses on, on one word. And when we talk about the protected categories, we have race, color, religion, sex, and the word that I focus on is or national origin. This is where intersectionality breaks down because the language of this statute includes the word or, which in, I mean, to me, it implies that you can only bring a, a claim about race, color, religion, sex, or national origin and not a combination of those things. But if you understand intersectionality, you know that people experience life and experience and interact with the law based on multiple of these protected categories. And so I decided that I was gonna offer some solutions. Nobody asked, but I decided I was gonna offer some. So next slide. We talked about this, you can go to the next slide, thank you. All right, so I broke down these solutions into the three different branches of government. So we're back in high school now, Government 101. And my first solution, next slide, involves the EEOC, which as we all know, is the sole agency in charge of receiving and processing discrimination claims. And to me, what the EEOC could do is issue clear, concrete guidance to courts on not just the theory of intersectionality, which they've done, but also the practical and analytical steps of resolving cases involving intersectional plaintiffs. I spent quite a bit of time looking at the guidance that the EOC has issued on intersectionality, and it is awful. <laughs> if you don't have time to read it and di dissect it and digest it, you won't know what to do as a judge. My Second solution, um, unfortunately, involves Congress. <laughs> Next slide. And uh, as we know, over the past uh, decade or so, Congress hasn't really done much. But Congress could actually solve this entire issue by amending Title VII, the language in it, and including the phrase or any combination thereof, so that it prohibits discrimination based on the protected categories or any combination thereof. This would rid the courts of ambiguity about whether women of color or a black Haitian American person can bring a claim based on race and national origin. There would be no theorizing about whether this creates a super remedy for somebody who experiences racism based on both of those categories or more. Next slide. And my final solution, um, which in today's political climate, I find to be a stretch is to let the Supreme Court decide. That, that might be a little dangerous given what we've got going on up there. But um, 
time and time again, the Supreme Court has taken the social, political, and economical history of an oppressed group into consideration when analyzing whether the laws disparately impact said group. It's nothing new. They, they did it in Brown versus Board of Education and they did it in VMI. And in my opinion, I believe they can do it here too. Um, there's a circuit split in, amongst the fifth and the ninth circuit that could be resolved by the Supreme Court. And if they go the way that I want them to go, we wouldn't have this issue because that would be the law of the land. But like I said, nobody asked me for my solutions, but I came up with them anyway. And I hope that you agree with me. And I, and if you don't, I really would like to hear more about it. But that concludes <laughs> my explanation of intersectionality and what I think we can do about integrating it into the court. Great, thank you, Yvette. Um, we'll follow up on some of those solutions and um, dive deeper into what that actually looks like in practice. But um, what I'm hearing is that critical race theories like intersectionality were really created to acknowledge and problematize the racism and white supremacy underlying many of our institutions and how our laws need to be like re rethought and recast is I think the phrase that um, Kimberly Crenshaw uses um, to address those institutional issues. Um, Jaribu, can you elaborate on some of the historical context around the unique discrimination Black women face as participants in this country's labor force? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Simone, and thank you, my sister Yvette, for your uh, insights. As a Title VII lawyer, I certainly agree with you and would love to join you in sparring with the other side. <laughs> I would first like to thank the National Women's uh, Law Center for a couple of things. First, for inviting me today. Uh, and also for believing in our work to the extent that we were provided with resources a couple of years ago to litigate a sexual harassment case on behalf of a Black woman who was a bus janitor. And uh, we received resources from the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund through the National Women's Law Center. So thank you for uh, the support. Thank you for, as we say, putting your money where your mouth is. That so seldom happens. I wanna lift up women who support other women. In terms of the history, as I thought about the history of oppression, the history of suffering that black women have experienced, particularly in this country, although I could go all day long talking about the widespread oppression of black women throughout the diaspora, uh, in terms of women of African descent, in terms of women who would have been of African descent had they not been dropped somewhere else like the Caribbean or other places where black women are found. And so I, I thought about intersectionality because I also consider myself to be a student of uh, that particular frame and also that particular concept as a way of understanding oppression, as a way of understanding exploitation. And so I go back to the mothers of intersectionality. I go back to Flo Kennedy. I go back to Angela Davis's race, class, and the law, her frame around triple oppression of Black women, race, class, and gender oppression. And I go back to people like Bell Hooks. And of course, uh, my Shiro, I, she ties with Fannie, only with Fannie Lou Hamer, and that's Polly Murray, who was so, so on time and so ahead of her time in terms of the framing and also in terms of the way she looked at the issues. Uh, next slide. So this is sort of a historical timeline that speaks to the ways in which we show up as Black women. Uh, the year 1619, of course, is pivotal and critical because it represents some of the beginnings, not the whole story in terms of the beginnings of our uh, being located in this particular place at this particular time in history. So 1619 represents the very early, early ways that Black women were forced to show up, first of all, being kidnapped. Uh, forced to come to a strange land away from their indigenous soil, 
onto the soil that was already exploited and stolen from the first people in this country who we call indigenous people, who we call native people or whatever term they prefer. So the sexual exploitation, the sexual exploitation was built into the structure, built into the fabric of how this particular empire developed and grew. And we look at some of the earliest examples of women who were victims in bondage. We look at Sally Hemings, who was a victim 13 times of the slave master president and art, one of the architects of the uh, the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, who was in fact uh, her slaver, was in fact her jailer and her bondage holder, but also the father of her 13 children. I have cited for you examples of uh, historical moments when it's been particularly severe and graphic in terms of the oppression of women. And I, I also dedicate and locate these comments with early Rosas, as I call them, of course, Rosa Parks, but Claudette Colvin, who was uh, in fact one of the early black women who refused to give up her seat and uh, because she was at that time a teenager who was also with child, it was determined that she would not make a good poster child for, uh, even though her courage was earlier than uh, Rosa. I also think about how Polly Murray in 1940 refused to give up her seat on a Virginia bus. So there are so many examples of resistance. And when I, when I point out to you in 1945, Lena Baker, that story haunts me as much as the story of Emmett Till's lynching haunts me, the story of Lena Baker haunts me. A black domestic worker who lived and worked in slavery after emancip emancipation. What do we mean? She was working as a domestic, she was not paid. She was forced to not only do menial grudge driven chores, but she was forced to put out sexually. And finally, when she resisted, trying to save herself from being raped, she grabbed her employer's shotgun and it accidentally went off. And of course, those of you who followed the story or maybe you've learned about it in our recent history, she was convicted of murder and executed by the state. She received a posthumous pardon, uh, both in terms of what President Obama did and also how the community continues to show up and her family members continue to demand justice for Lena Baker. Recy Taylor, just the year before, and Oprah did an excellent job of telling this story and sharing it with many who didn't know about Recy. But also, there's an excellent documentary about the rape of Recy Taylor, who was kidnapped in rural Alabama after leaving a church service, gang raped by five young white men, and never, ever got justice. She died without getting justice. She spoke up and fought for it, but she died without getting justice herself. And I always like to point to the work of the women at Sanderson's farm, poultry plant, Gloria Jordan, I'm sorry the slide has a typo, but Gloria Jordan was a courageous labor leader who along with other black and poor white women decided that they had had enough. They had had enough of being rubbed up against and experiencing uh, the boss's erection, no less had enough of being fondled and groped and threatened with retaliation, with termination, if they didn't go along and allow themselves to be touched against their will. And so Gloria Jordan was, is a 20th century hero, shero for us because she and other black women and poor white women at Sanderson's farm stood up against some of the worst forms of sexual harassment racial harassment and class oppression. In 2011, because of the courage of black and brown domestic workers who put everything on the line to expose workplace abuses and indignities they suffered while trying to make a living, the plight of all domestic workers was brought to the world stage. The General Conference of the International Labor Organization, better known as ILO, enacted the Domestic Workers Convention 
in 2011, number 189. You can look it up, you can Google it, you can check out the powerful language and the provisions that at least aspirationally are provided for some of the most oppressed women in our world today. And they are indeed triply, triply oppressed. They're oppressed because they're Black, they're oppressed because they're women and they're oppressed because they are poor women. And we would do a disservice if we didn't always include class in our analysis. We would not be telling the full story if we did not include class as some of my sister Yvette slides show you in terms of income. That's what we're talking about class. We're talking about people who are not situated the same way. So Condoleezza Rice and Jeribu Hill are not situated in the same way. Although I am an attorney now, I'm the daughter of a Mississippi sharecropper and grew up poor in Cleveland, Ohio on what we call concrete uh, poverty. So we're different. We have class differences, we have social differences, we have differences in terms of where our heads are, it's certainly uh, where, particularly with regard to myself and Ms. Rice, but differences nonetheless in terms of class underpinnings. So what we're concerned about is this thing called body as property. We're concerned about skin for the taking. We're concerned about the fact that the Me Too movement has now been popularized and commercialized to some extent, but the early, early forms of Me Too are some of the images that you see on this screen today from Lena Baker to Joanne Little, who was actually prosecuted because she fought off her rapist. Many Black women have experienced that. Body is bondage. Many of us today see women in the chicken plants and poultry plants, in factories, in domestic situations where they are working in people's homes uh, for little or no wages and forced to be there basically as 21st century enslaved women. So there are many ways that we show up. In terms of litigation, I'll just quickly say that uh, our, our portfolio of legal cases include both race and sex cases. We address a lot in terms of racially hostile work environments. We look at nooses that, uh, you know, historically have been symbols of and actual replicas of slavery and lynchings, but they also are found in the workplace. They show up in the workplace and there have been attempted lynchings and we've been privilege to represent a couple of workers who literally were victims of attempted lynchings. We've been privileged to represent women who, uh, like our most recent client whose name has to remain uh, kept under wraps, at least for now, until we get the victory and then we'll go public. But she is someone who is profoundly oppressed on all three levels, race, class, and gender. She was a CV CVA certified nurse's assistant, CVNA, I'm sorry, certified nurse's assistant at a nursing home in uh, Mississippi. And uh, her husband contracted COVID and subsequently died from COVID. Two days after her husband's death, she was terminated because she revealed her diagnosis as having COVID as well. Uh, but that's not the whole story. The story that brings us to this screen today is the fact that while she was working as a certified nurse's assistant, she was assigned to the showers. She was assigned to give patients their showers and help them with their grooming. Well, the owner of this particular nursing home, the boss himself, decided when he had some health problems, he was going to check himself into the nursing home, no less, which is not the place where he was supposed to go. But because he was the boss, he took license and liberty and began to force people to give him care. And one of the ways that he forced people to give him care was to force my client to be the one to give him his showers. Now, what's wrong with that? She was the person to shower patients. He's not a patient, but well, what's wrong with that? What goes deeper is the fact that she was the only black woman who was giving the showers. All of the other people giving showers were white C uh, nurses assistants. He asked for her and demanded that she be the person to wash him down. And I mean, when I say wash him down, to shower him, to wash his genitals, to wash him down. And he was her employer. Is there anything, can you see anything wrong with that picture? 
And unfortunately, sometimes the whole story doesn't come around until the statute of limitations has run. So on some of these issues, we're not even gonna be able to touch it because we didn't know that story while we were bringing and developing her case. We're gonna find a way, we're gonna figure it out. We're gonna figure out if there's some state claims that can be brought to append along with the Title VII, I'm sorry, the e EEOC ADA action that we're bringing. But these are just some glimpses into what women are facing today and what they faced from 1619 until the 21st century. We see the same suffering. We see laws that are woefully inadequate. We see a timidity with regard to litigation. Uh, Sometimes we call it litigation phobia. Sometimes we call it being timid. Sometimes we call it being too, just too inflexibly, if there is such a word, uh, tied to the law in a way where you don't think outside the box, where you don't challenge the fact that the law from Dred Scott to now has always been a law of exclusion, a law of rank and systemic oppression and exploitation. So if you look at it through that lens, through the lens of a movement lawyer or a people's lawyer or a social engineer, if you will, then you'll see that some of these contradictions from 1619 are still with us today. I thank you so much for bringing me on and for the opportunity to work with other sisters who are on this screen. Thank you, Jeribu, um, for providing us with that um, very important landscape. I think that those historical underpinnings and that information um, is really important to understanding intersectionality and um, doing this work. So thank you for that. Um, in order to um, discuss some of these issues further, I'd like to do um, a little bit more of a moderated discussion with uh, Yvette and Jeribu and Professor Williams and Elizabeth, you can join in um, as you see fit. Um, but Yvette, how can we use the concept, concept of intersectionality and the historical context surrounding Black women in the workforce to inform our litigation efforts and our policy work? Um, I mean, to me, it's simple. I, you know, people say history repeats itself. And the, the good thing about being a lawyer is that you can just go to Westlaw and see what's already been done. There are tons of cases out there that have brought these claims before and we've seen how they've ended up. We've seen the pitfalls, we've seen the mistakes that the judges made. Um, I'm calling them mistakes, but some of them are intentional. <laughs> and we need to use those mistakes and what we see to really be strategic about what it is that we are bringing these claims for. So for example, if you're bringing a claim and your plaintiff is straddling between two or more of the protected categories, you need to make that clear in your complaint. Don't wait until the summary judgment portion to now say, oh, by the way, she also has a disability. And she, oh, no, bring it all in the paragraph. Am I frozen? Can you guys hear me? All right, right. So let's bring it to the forefront. And also before I became a, a lawyer, I was a social scientist. And so I am a big fan of putting statistics into these complaints and referring these judges to untraditional um, sources that they wouldn't find in normal legal papers. But if you have an opportunity to present and advocate for your client in front of a judge, then you better be putting those footnotes in there. You better be putting those statistics in there to understand, to really make it clear for them. Because assuming that a judge's mind is tuned to look at something intersectionally, inter, intersectionally is a mistake, right? And I think that going in, because you know the facts and you know the issues that your clients are facing, you're like, well, this is a slam dunk. Of course, it's because she's a black woman who's been chosen to bathe this person. You know what I mean? It's like, if you know history, of course, Jeribu, you've studied this. This is, you, you can do this in your sleep. So the very idea that the one black woman who was available or who is there is the one chosen to do this humiliating work 
to use screams intersectional discrimination, but to a judge who doesn't live and breathe this, like, okay, well, I mean, randomly they picked the black woman and random. No, it's not random. And we need to make that clear to them using the statistics, using the historical documents, because I don't know about you guys, but read, you know, when I got into law school the first year, we were reading these old, old cases. And I was wondering, why are we reading this case? Madison, what is it? McCullough versus, I mean, why? <laughs> I understand why, but it's completely historical. And we need to read it in order to understand why we are here today. Same deal. Well, why can't we put historical narratives into our complaints and into our pleadings to really paint the picture, to make the case for why you have to apply an intersectional lens if just this is what you really care about. Thank you, Yvette. Um, Joan, did you wanna jump in to say something about that? Or, I know we're gonna talk a lot about your um, recommendations for um, how attorneys can work up cases from beginning to end that include more of an intersectional lens. But if you wanted to jump in, feel free. Um, I, I think I'll pass and give, give other people the time. Okay, sounds good. Um, so, <laughs> Jaribo, you talked a lot about um, the experiences that Black women have had in the, well, the workforce in this country. Um, and one of the things that I've been particularly interested in is um, the ways that we experience discrimination. And it may not be obvious to the white male judge considering a case, but as a Black woman, it's very, very obvious to me that this was discrimination based on the fact that I'm Black and I'm a woman. Um, so can you talk about some of the common tropes or stereotypes that can contribute to the difficulties Black women face at work and um, kind of lay a foundation for understanding some of that so that when an attorney gets a, a case or is deciding whether it's quote unquote winnable, that they can have a better understanding of what some of this discrimination looks like. Sure, thank you for the question. And uh, as we've been talking about intersectionality, as we've been talking about how can we bring claims that are joined at the hip together, they're one in the same forms of discrimination. I think about the history of jurisprudence in this country. I think about the fact that you have this thing called strict scrutiny, but poverty is not a suspect class in this country. And I remember in law school, as many of you remember, studying the San Antonio Independent School District v. Rodriguez case, where that was announced by the Supreme Court that poverty is not a suspect class. And so for us, the problem with intersectionality and the courts is that it doesn't even include the whole frame. It doesn't even include the whole uh, formula that has to be dealt with and addressed. Intersectionality between race and gender can in fact be raised not so successfully in my circuit, the Fifth Circuit, which is dreadful, but it can be raised if as, uh, my sister said earlier, it has to be raised in a contemporaneous way. It cannot be raised as an afterthought, and it has to be raised within the confines of the statute of limitations, because if you raise it after the 180 day period, which is what we deal with here in our circuit, if you raise it after the 180 day period that there's also a sex discrimination issue or a gender issue, then you're gonna run afoul of the law. And of course, even the most clumsy and unskilled defense lawyer is going to call you on it. So it is better to really unpack your case, really interview, interview, interview. And I say interview because it is an interrogation although it's user-friendly, hopefully, that we do with our prospective client on the front end, where we try to find out as much as we can about what that person has gone through and how that could in fact be both sexual harassment, race harassment, gender harassment, harassment because the person only had options to do this type of crummy work, which was the case of the uh, plaintiff that we represented in the sexual harassment case last year. 
living in poverty, always having rotten jobs, didn't get a chance to finish high school because of the obstacles along the way. And so thrust into these jobs over and over again. So I think, I think when litigating, I think everything has to show up. Everything has to come in. Everything that can come in and even things that we think might not be able to come in. We won for all intents and purposes a case against the largest employer in the state. It was a racially hostile work environment case. We even got a cause finding from EEOC against the nooses in the workplace and the attempted lynchings were too much even for the agency to turn the other way and issue the usual, we were unable to find anything. So with that, we were able to get relief for more than a hundred uh, plaintiffs and we were able to change that work place into a zero tolerance workplace where nooses and graf racist graffiti and Confederate flags painted on hard hats are no longer allowed in the workplace. But I think doing, bringing that case also showed us that there were so many limitations within the law, so many limitations because there were so many things we wanted to bring regarding class, regarding the fact that some of the jobs were assigned to black people because of their race, because of their class. And we were not able to really bring those issues. Of course, we raised them in our pleadings, mm -hmm. but we were not able to request relief on the grounds of class oppression. And legislatively and uh, jurisprudentially, in all ways, we as uh, pavement scholars and academy scholars, we've got to begin to unpack the stuff that should have been unpacked. And that is that uh, class has to become a suspect class. Our brothers and sisters in the LGBTQ community, particularly queer women, have done an outstanding job, have they not, of forcing that issue and forcing the issue of the suspect class based on sexual preference. Why is it that we're not able to do the same in terms of economic oppression? We've got to get there. And I think those Absolutely. are some CLEs and conversations we need to have. Thank you, Jaribu. Um, I don't mean to cut you off, but I am going to throw it to um, Joan because I think that's a beautiful segue into the practical application of intersectionality to legal work. So um, Joan, if you could go ahead and give your presentation um, on your wonderful article. Okay, next slide. The, the first, what I'm arguing is that women of color and in many contexts, black women specifically are the canary in the mine. Um, if you fix the bias for them, you fix the bias for everyone. Um, so there are five basic patterns of workplace bias. Um, these are race gender patterns. Um, some of them are also triggered by social class. First, prove it again. Some groups have to prove themselves more than others. Um, second, the tightrope. Some groups need to be politically savvier than others. The third maternal wall, um, which is gender bias triggered by motherhood. And the fourth is tug of war, um, which is simply that in-group favoritism works for the dominant group, but it doesn't work the same way for other groups. And then finally, most of racial, uh, much of racial, racial bias is picked up, picked up by prove it again, tightrope and tug of war, but there are also specific racial stereotypes. For example, um, that Asian Americans are good at technical things, but not good um, at, uh, at leadership. So there's, it, you have additional racial stereotypes. So one of the things I wanted to communicate to the lawyers is that there are these five different patterns of bias. Um, and that sometimes you see a couple and not others, but you should think about and be looking for category, all of these five categories. And that's important because at the, I provided you with an interview protocol, I'll show you later to make sure you picked up every single piece of evidence that might be relevant to your case. Next slide. Um, the, um, also, what I've done is basically taken hundreds of social, uh, uh, of social science studies and integrated them into these five patterns. So the bias is e easy to find. Also, um, I have huge amounts of data from what we call the Workplace Experiences Survey, which is a simple 10-minute climate survey that picks up every basic form of implicit bias by race, gender, and social class origin, where the bias plays out, 
And what is the impact of the bias on, on outcome measures by like belonging and intent to stay? And you see, we have a whole bunch of national samples. The um, study of scientists and the study of tech uh, are um, focused on women of color specifically. Um, the rest of them um, look at both race and gender simultaneously. Next, um, <clears throat> next slide. So um, here is some of that workplace experiences data. This is all from architects, but it's very similar in, in the other, in, um, uh, other industries that we have surveyed. If you ask my, yourself, I have to prove myself more than my colleagues um, uh, the, of similar education and experience. You can see that only a quarter of white men say yes, but about half of everybody else and that women of color report the highest rates of prove it again bias. And among them, black women do. This is the intersectionality effect. Um, women of color are triggering two sets of negative competence assumptions, uh, gender and race. And that's why they, um, they report this high level. Now, one of the implications of this is that if you are in uh, arguing before a court that gets all uptight about saying, oh my God, this is a black woman, I don't want to create a third, you know, a million categories, um, this it, you can just say, okay, this is gender bias, or this is race bias, or it's both, because it is. Um, and so it's not an either or, you're alleging both gender bias and racial bias because we have this data that shows that people, pe uh, women have to prove themselves more and people have to, of color have to prove themselves more. And so we, this is all in the Law Review article along with a lot of research. Um, we were, we were, I think Jaribu or someone was talking about the footnotes. Uh, all the footnotes are written for you. They're all in this article. Next slide. Um, the second major form of bias is tightrope bias, and that's that some groups need to be politically save, savvier than men in white men in order to succeed. Um, basically, white men just need to be authoritative and ambitious, but every other group needs to be authoritative and ambitious in a way that's seen as appropriate by white men. And that's, of course, politically far more difficult. Um, and so here is just an example of tightrope bias, pushback for anger. You can see in this slide, it was really interesting, white women report the largest divergence from men for um, pushback for anger. I can show anger even when it's justified. Um, you would think that would be um, people of color, but here in this particular sample, it's white women. In other samples, it's, it's people of color. Um, but the super interesting thing about another tightrope question, which is I get pushback when I behave assertively, the bias there is highest for Asian American women who report more pressure to behave in feminine ways and more push pushback when they don't. Um, next slide. All of this is in the article. Here's maternal well bias. Um, I uh, did not have my commitment and competence questioned after I had children. You can see this is chiefly gender, not racial bias. So far, we've been looking at forms of bias that are both racial and gender. This is pure gender bias, as you can see. And um, uh, next slide. Um, then the tug of war is basically, it's often called crabs in a barrel in the racial context or queen bee in the gender context. Um, that's when bias against a group fuels conflict within the group. And here's a good example. Professionals of color and um, uh, white women often report more pushback in um, receiving the same kinds of support from admins that white men do. Um, and you can see this is um, here, this is one of the displays where women of color and um, it's higher, uh, it's a higher, it's a gender effect for white women and women of color, but it's also a racial effect because you see men of color equally affected. Um, next slide. Um, here's um, experienced racism. Uh, you can see um, black people um, much higher than everybody else. 13% uh, by 67%, that's a big black, uh, big gap. Next slide. 
um, experience sexism here, white women. That's partly because some of the, uh, when when people of color, especially black women report uh, experience prove it again bias, they are typically attributed to race rather than to sex. So that's what drives this effect. Next slide. Um, and then I'll just go through these really quickly. Um, equal access to opportunities, awesome to be a white guy. Next slide, look at the difference with women of color. Fair performance evaluations, awesome to be a white guy. Next slide, um, I get paid fairly. Look at this difference between white men and women of color. Next slide, um, I've been given the promotions I deserve. Um, next slide. Um, people who uh, here who succeed are like me. Look at the divergence again with women of color. Next slide. Um, uh, satisfied with my career. Again, a big divergence. Next slide. So this is basically uh, making gender and racial hierarchy um, sort of uh, 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 obvious for anyone to see. Um, so how do you prove these things? Of course, you prove, prove it again bias through comparators. And in some of these racial cases, for example, where you just have these um, little bit of evidence of open racial discrimination, um, you can look to see if people of color are being held to higher standards. And that could maybe help bolster those cases. Um, tightrope bias, of course, this is stereotyping evidence, um, stereotyping of the angry black person or the bitchy woman. Um, so that comes in, of course, through stereotyping evidence. You can also compare of, you know, um, uh, he had a bad day, she was way out of control. You can, so that's comparator evidence where you can see that some white men basically have a, a, a much broader range of behaviors accepted from white men than anybody else. So that's comparator. Um, maternal wall, um, uh, we run a network for people who are litigating cases based on caregiving discrimination. So join our network. Um, this, we designed this law so that it's based on stereotyping. You don't need to find a comparator. We, there are a whole bunch of ways you can use comparators. Happy to talk about that if it's of interest. Racial stereotyping, of course, is Price Waterhouse. And then there's this cool tug of war um, uh, bias case. You can see there, it's discussed in the Law Review article where basically a black woman is being told by a black man that she should behave all nice because that's the way that black people thrive here. Again, uh, bias against a group, feeling conflicts within the group. Next slide. Um, do you need an expert for this? No, just as when we were designing the caregiver discrimination law, which we pioneered, we've been very careful to make sure you don't need an expert because experts are expensive. So in the article, we have long sections that show how each of these five patterns have been broadly disseminated through popular culture. And that spotting any one of these patterns is something that any reasonable jury can, uh, can use, next, uh, can, can do, next slide. Um, and so countering some common defenses, the same actor defense, which is that namely, of course, as you remember, that the person who hired this plaintiff would not then have discriminated against the plaintiff. Um, that is totally against social science in ways that the article um, spells out. Um, maybe you hired the person as a junior woman um, and um, you were fine as long as she was a junior non-threatening woman, but now she's very senior and all of a sudden she's a raging bitch or a dragon lady or you name it. Um, so does, uh, from tightrope bias, um, doesn't make sense. Maternal low bias, you hired the girl and then she got knocked up and you're, you're, you're discriminating against her because she's a mother. Um, and when you hired her, she wasn't a mother. Same actor defense doesn't make any sense because um, the bias hadn't triggered in yet. Um, the personal animosity defense of this isn't bias, it's just personal dislike. Well, the literature on tightrope bias shows that a lot of bias is expressed as dislike. It's when lower status groups don't know their place. Um, lower status people who behave in deferential ways are liked and seen as reasonable. It's when we get uppity that things get intense. That is tightrope bias. That's their it -er form of tightrope bias. Next slide. 
Um, so here's the protocol. I really would urge you to try it out and help me improve it. It is um, basically, it has literal slides, you, uh, uh, questions you can ask your clients so that you can make sure you have picked up every scrap of evidence um, that um, I, as a fake social scientist, um, can possibly help you um, uh, identify. And particularly in some of these racial cases that are thrown out by thin evidence, um, this will help you pick up evidence of implicit bias uh, so you can conjoin that with these kind of ugly bete noir kind of comments. And again, if you pick up all of this stuff, remember, you can plead this as a gender case and a race case. And that's what this um, article will give you all of the footnotes and all of the background to do. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Joan. Um, Elizabeth, as a seasoned litigator and someone who brings the concepts of theories we've discussed to the work, can you discuss some of the real life or real world examples of how race and gender compound for Black women survivors of workplace sex harassment? Um, yes, I can. And, um, and I'll talk about a couple of examples of real life cases that I've dealt with. And then um, just a little bit about some more practical aspects about dealing with these cases. Um, you know, they, they can be difficult cases, because we're in a world where people, um, people are starting to accept implicit bias, but there are still a lot of people who don't even accept that as a concept. Um, and so it's hard to go into a courtroom to argue that to a judge who doesn't believe that it exists, um, or to a jury. Um, and I, I think, you know, the majority of people that you're facing, juries and judges, think of race discrimination or gender discrimination as happening in this very blatant way. And that's what they're looking for to tell them that that's what happened. And so um, a couple of examples that I've had um, recently dealt with Black women who, um, one was a woman, she had been a long time employee at this particular company. Um, she ended up getting promoted into this position where she was managing um, a good number of people, but they were all white, mostly women, but they were all white. Um, and, you know, her responsibilities were increasing. She was doing a very good job, um, but her subordinates, were making complaints to say that they felt like she was too intimidating, aggressive, things like that. And, you know, they would describe these situations that where she had greeted them in the morning to say hello, something that I would say is fairly innocuous, but they found it to be, you know, pushy um, or some other terms like that. And that in, instigated this sort of performance improvement plan for her from her supervisors who were also white women. Um, and so she's in, in the midst of it, she's saying, could there be implicit bias going on from my subordinates that this is what is getting them to treat me this way? And that wasn't recognized. And so she ends up in, you know, uh, employment jeopardy because of these particular stereotypes. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that can make some of these cases hard that not everybody would necessarily even recognize that. They wouldn't recognize the fact that these subordinates are complaining and you have to really dig into the facts about what really happened. What are the things that she's doing that people are complaining about and looking at it at a lens of, you know, is, is she really doing something that is intimidating in the workplace? Um, or is this um, really more about implicit bias having a Black person and particularly a Black woman be your supervisor? Um, and so, you know, I think Joan's model about the, all the questions that you want to ask when potential clients come in the door, I think are very important. I think it's also important with the things that Yvette said of really understanding what that prism is that this person is when they come to see you so that you understand what all the different lenses could be that are going on. 
Because in my experience, sometimes clients will recognize one aspect of it that, you know, they'll say, okay, this is racial, but they may not recognize that maybe it also has to do with the fact that they also come from a different country or that there are some other things that are going on. And so really digging into that, I think is important as you're trying to build your case to make sure that you are including everything. Um, because sometimes that stuff may come out later and then it's too late for you to do something about it. The statute of limitations has passed on that particular issue. Um, you know, all of those kinds of things. So that's really important. I had another case with a client also, black woman. She had been at the company for a long number of years and her supervisory structure got changed, which I think if you're an employment lawyer, like that's the quintessential story. Someone comes in and says, I was working and everything was great. Then I got a new supervisor. And then you're like, oh, there you go, red flag. And that's when stuff happens. Um, but in her situation, her supervisory chain changed and she was dealing with this person who I think employers would describe as um, a taskmaster, right? This is a person who's rude, who's bullying, who's mean to a lot of people. So she would sit in these meetings. She was feeling uncomfortable. He never said anything specifically um, racial or gender, but he disregarded her opinions, um, you know, wasn't listening to her. But she noticed that there was a few occasions where a woman who was white would join their team meetings and changed his entire demeanor to everyone. In those meetings, he was polite, friendly, courteous. Um, and that's a really subtle difference, but it changed her whole work environment. It changed the way she felt about work. It changed her confidence in her abilities. Um, all of these kinds of things, that's a really subtle thing to look at. And, you know, there was another woman of color, not black, but who participated in the meetings and that did not affect his behavior. But when this one woman who was white sat in on the meetings, it definitely changed it. So I think that, you know, these are, these can be really subtle situations um, and you really have to sort of dig into what is behind it? What are all the facts? What are all the things that are going on for that particular client when you're going through your intake process, when you're trying to figure out how are we gonna take this case? Um, I think it's also important, I think as a vet said before, when you're working on doing your pleadings, you wanna make sure that you're pleading everything and that if you're dealing with something that's intersectional, you need to make it clear that that is what you're saying, that it's, the, you, and, and frankly, I would say this or this and both. Um, you want to give yourself all of the options. You know, for the most part, the judges that we're facing in these cases are white and male. And we live in a society where whiteness is invisible for people. You know, maleness can be invisible. And it's not something that they think about. And now we're putting these things in their face. And so we need to make it as visible as possible. The statistics, the information, the history, I think all of that is important. But I also think really recognizing what the stereotypes are that are behind the behavior is important. You know, if, if this is a case where the employer is saying, well, she just doesn't fit in, or I just don't like her, or this is a personality conflict, what are the descriptions that they're using to say why it is that this person doesn't fit in? Is it because she's pushy? It's because she's aggressive? It's because she's um, intimidating or mean or she doesn't smile enough? You know, these are all the kinds of things that you want to be looking for because that's where the stereotypes are. That's where you're able to point to it and say, no, this is actually racial. I mean, I've had cases where you, you, you know, you want to look at performance evaluations, stuff creeps in when they're describing what the problems are with this employee, where they're describing, I had a case with a, a person of color, he's a salesperson, and they were like, he's too aggressive, I'm like, really, like, <laughs> this is sales, this is the time that you're supposed to be 
lauding how aggressive they are at getting the, the person to buy the machine or whatever it is. And yet that's the complaint that you have about this black man, you know? So, I mean, that's when I think you really have to do as much of that due diligence as you can ahead of time, if you can, to get performance evaluations, to get emails, whatever it is, because those words, those stereotypes and descriptions will creep in. Um, you know, they will be present. And that's how you can build your case to say, this is bias, this is gender and race. You know, this person was discriminated against because she was a black woman. And you can see that because she's described as angry and intimidating and aggressive. And these are all those stereotypes about black women. And then you can point to how we know what those are. You know, we know about Michelle Obama being described as an angry black woman. All of those stereotypes that are known in our society, here they are on paper in the email from the employer or the performance evaluation. Um, I think comparators, as much as you can get them, um, I think is helpful and it's a fight. It can be a, a difficult fight because I think employers often hide behind you know, employee privacy um, and a lot of other reasons not to provide that information. Um, but it can be golden in sort of showing, for example, that your client who was a black woman and disabled wasn't given as many sort of buys or mistakes as this other person who was. Um, and so, it's, it's important to keep digging to push for that. Um, so I, I, that's sort of how these things show up in the real world. Um, it can be subtle. I think it's, you know, doing that due diligence in the beginning is really important so that you can find all of those things because even your client may not know or recognize them all. Um, and so it's on you to try and really find that out. Thank you, Elizabeth. We've had a couple of questions um, populated in the question and answer chat. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and start that portion so that we have enough time to get people's questions answered. And I also have a few questions of my own that I can um, give you as well. But the first question we've received is, how can you deal with conduct that would fit under both um, Section 1981 for race and Title VII for race and gender, but the Title VII statute of limitations has expired. Is there any way to frame that to get in the gendered conduct? I'm gonna copy and paste it so you all can see the exact question if for whatever reason you can't see the Q&A. Um, Well, so I'm not gonna be able to answer exactly. I'll give you some of my thoughts on it. And I will say part of the issue for me is I'm a lawyer in California. Um, so I do less work on the federal level because California's laws are so much more advantageous. And um, so that's something that we benefit from. I know um, one of the things that you might look for is what are sort of the state issues that you might have to be able to get the gender conduct in. Um, I know, at least in California, even under our constitution, there are prohibitions against gender discrimination. Um, so there may be other laws um, and protections that you can use to help get in the, the gender um, issue, um, even if the statute of limitations under Title VII has um, expired. Um, and sometimes, <clears throat> depending on how you frame the case, what the story is, you may be able to get the information in as part of the story of the case, um, even if it's not necessarily a remedy that you can seek. Um, and so sometimes that can be helpful in just sort of present presenting what the issues are. <clears throat> Elizabeth has said, we very seldom leave out 1981. We always allege 
violations under both inside of that Title VII uh, lawsuit. The claim around Section 1981 has some expansive relief that Title VII doesn't offer. So getting that in is crucial if you know at the very beginning that there's gender bias, there's gender discrimination, as well as race discrimination. You also should look to, and I'm sure you have, uh, the person who asked the question probably is litigating these cases as well. One of the things that helps out is that there is additional coverage uh, in terms of the statute of limitations, depending on your state statute. So in Mississippi, the state statute that governs everything is our negligence statute, which is three years, right? So don't just assume that because you're outside the 180 day window that you don't still have a section 1981 claim. You gotta unpack it, you gotta look at it closely, but there is a possibility that you may have run out of time under Title VII, but you may not have run out of time under Section 1981 for that additional claim to come in. And then don't forget about state law. If, uh, I mean, there are different remedies under state law we're looking at right now in this uh, case that we're, that we're involved in the ADA case, we're looking also at state remedies as well. Everything from intentional infliction of emotional distress to straight up negligence. So let's look at both, I say. Awesome, thank you both for um, chiming in there. One other question I received is, um, I'd love to hear more about the state level policy advocacy and pushing intersectional legislation at the state level. Specifically, where in the law can we add intersectional analyses slash language to demonstrate that it is a workable legal standard? Um, I mean, I would let Yvette answer that <laughs> if she wanted to. <laughs> but yeah, this, um, is, this is for everyone. Anyone can chime in on these questions, either just from the group generally. But I mean, I would definitely say that, I mean, there are a number of different things that we can do either on the state level and frankly, federal level. I mean, I think extending the statute of limitations just is, is something that should happen anyway, um, particularly for any women, women of color who are dealing with trauma, who are dealing with assault or any other things like that. I mean, discrimination is such a harmful thing that happens to people and it just takes people time to recover, to get themselves together, to figure out what they wanna do. And so um, that 180 days is, I mean, I'm sorry, but it's ridiculous. Um, you know, California did recently extend our statute of limitations to three years to file a claim for that stuff. Um, and, you know, why discrimination, which allegedly is something that we so deeply care about, we so deeply do not want to be occurring in our country, would have one of the shortest statute of limitations for anything, that doesn't make any sense. So that would be one thing to do. And I think that could make a huge difference for uh, lawyers who are representing clients and for the clients themselves you know, including language specifically in your statutes about discrimination that says or both or combination thereof, as Yvette suggested, I think could also be great if you're not getting the right kind of jurisprudence um, along those lines. I don't want to hog up the time. <laughs> no, that was perfect. And I, I don't have much to add, except that we shouldn't focus on trying to get the idea of inter intersectionality in a statute, we should try to find these more practical ways like extending the statute of limitations so that we have more time to build our case, right? So the issue with these cases is that at the summary judgment level is when the plaintiffs kind of fail, like everything just kind of falls apart at that point because the defendants can always just point out they just have more paper. And I'm coming from a defense point of view. That's just what we do. We have more paper. We have more discovery. We could just push, 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 push. And so that 180 days doesn't give the plaintiff the, the opportunity to really build the case and actually file the complaint that has all of the relevant facts in there. And then when it comes to summary judgment, the defendant can just say, well, we've hired black, a black man and we've never fired a white woman. So you as a black woman are X out case closed. So 
I think that that's a great um, response to that question. That statute of limitations thing is a huge. I agree. I, I think that that is one of the biggest barriers. And I also think that we should push for uh, more coverage in the same way that the medical malpractice uh, cause of action provides the discovery rule where uh, you didn't know that there was medical malpractice. You discovered it over the course of another medical procedure that someone left a sponge inside your body and you were still able to allege that form of medical malpractice. I think in some of these cases where you have recollection after trauma, there has to be a way, like they're doing with many men who are now fully grown, who were raped as children within the Catholic Church. Now there is a question, and even in the Me Too work, there's this notion of why did they wait so long? Why did they wait so long? I think that we have to really expand those types of protections to include uh, provisions for discovery kinds of uh, issues where I, I, I just realized it. I just remembered that as a child, when I was five years old, I was raped. I'm 35 now, but I remember it. And so are you saying that there's no coverage, there's no protection for those victims? And surely they've come a long way with some of the victims uh, within, uh, and I won't just say the Catholic Church, I'll say uh, rapes of young children uh, where they didn't realize it until they were fully grown what it was that caused them to be so damaged. So I think that that would be another avenue of relief that we could explore. Great, we're getting a lot of really great questions. Um, so one of the questions that was populated in the chat is, um, I represent a fabulous black woman who is a supervisor that encountered all of the bias you stated, um, that she was angry, strident, and aggressive. It wore her down and perturbed her so that she did understandably start some direct conflict. How do we manage that additional complication? So I think the complication being like once you're pushed to the point of um, having direct con conflict with um, other coworkers on, or supervisors, how do you deal with that? Um, that I fact some, in your litigation. I have some thoughts there, Simone, if I can take that one. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, I think this is where the idea that one of the um, key forms that bias plays out is to make some people's politics complicated, more complicated than others. Um, of like that you can find a comparator and show that she got angry and it was like a huge deal and some white man got angry and he was just having a bad day um, and say, this is exactly, there's this huge literature shows this, this is exactly the way that gender bias plays out. There's also research on racial bias. It's less strong. Uh, I mean, there's less uh, research on it, which is pretty ironic, but, um, and then once you have that dynamic started, she is in this political treadmill that really disadvantages her. And that's exactly the way this stereotyping dis, uh, delivers discrimination. That's what I would say. And I just one thing is that um, I noted in the chat, I would never talk about implicit bias. It's been targeted. Never, I uh, know. This is all just simple stereotyping, which the Supreme Court said is illegal. Um, it, that's also good from a technical standpoint because implicit bias is driven by stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So I would never talk about any of this. These are just common forms of stereotyping. And if I could just jump in real quick, get everything Joan just said. I never cop to it. I never, if they come up with that crazy scenario, I never ever give way to it. I don't even acknowledge its existence as far as my client. We were given a beautiful case to look at and help develop. And the person, the firm that was gonna bankroll the case or support the case decided not to go with it because they felt that the black woman who had been depicted in that way it was too difficult for them to be able to show her as likable to the jury. And I just thought, wow, this is a plaintiff's lawyer saying that. That was really terrifying, you know. Uh, but yeah, biases within us that sometimes keep us from going forward. If he says that about her, then 
it's just the opposite as far as I'm concerned. If he says that she is a B-I-T-C-H, then I'm gonna say, oh, she's a woman of grace. You know, I'm not, I'm gonna go the opposite direction of what the defendant, how the defendant is characterizing someone that they've been responsible for abusing and setting aside. White people have a strong um, stereotype that women should be nice. Um, yeah. We, our research also has um, evidence that white women police black women into appropriate niceness and femininity. That is a key form of um, gender slash racial uh, uh, discrimination. Uh, the, I, the only other thing I would add to that is, you know, this could be something that you try and push on in depositions of these supervisors. Like how much do uh, pushing would they take before they got angry and blew up because you know there's a, they either are going to admit that at some point yeah I would have gotten angry about that and I I might have raised my voice or you know have they ever raised their voice in the workplace I mean this these are things that you can push on in deposition so they're either going to admit that 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 it happens we're human beings not everybody is sweet and wonderful and nice all the time especially when someone is accusing you of something or they're going to go the, you know, go the opposite and say, oh, never, never, never. But then they don't sound believable. I mean, I'm sorry, but I mean, I had a case with a, a woman who was sexually assaulted at work and she complained about it. Nothing happened and she quit. And the super, the head of their HR was telling me, well, you know, she, she shouldn't have quit. She should have given us another chance. And I'm like, okay, so like, when would it have been okay to quit if she'd been sexually assaulted a second time, then could she quit? And he was still saying no, but okay. So now he's lost all credibility on that, right? Like, so, you know, th these are the things um, that I think you can dig through when you're going through your discovery and depositions um, to push the envelope on what they're saying about how difficult or angry or upset this person got when things were happening to them. So part of the leveraging we were able to do in the uh, Time's Up case that we did last year was to show how outrageous the conduct was of the defendants. Uh, in one deposition, the owner of the company, who's a black man, jumped up from the table and put his finger in my face and started shouting at me. So I knew he was going to be crazy. I knew he was going to be crazy at trial in the witness box and I was crossing him. So I was just laying low and, be, and shrinked a little bit, if you can imagine, to become the victim of this, you know, outrageous conduct. And I looked at her, his lawyer, and I said, you're going to allow this? Aren't you going to admonish your client that right now he's being really extremely inappropriate in his conduct and foreboding and almost intimidating. Can you, can you talk to him? Can you take him to the side, take a break and take him to the side? And I knew that this guy who was such a misogynistic sexist who had done stuff himself, but he wasn't the one being brought. It was his employee who was the grabber in my case, but I knew he wasn't gonna be able to hold up. I knew they weren't gonna like him. I knew this, the, we were in the driver's seat. So we were, I believe we were able to leverage a really decent settlement because these guys were just, just horrible and they were gonna be horrible at trial in the witness box. So discovery, I agree with, with Elizabeth, discovery is so, it's more important than trial. These depositions reveal so much and those transcripts are powerful. Like when someone says to you, do you have anything in place that deals with altercations in the workplace? The guy says to me, no, but now that you've sued me, I sure will come up with something. So I mean, I can just pull it, highlight that and put it up on the elbow and say, did you say this? You know, so I, I just think there are ways to really in discovery through, through the depositions, the requests for documents, requests for information, and even doing workplace inspections. We go on site to the workplace and inspect. We have a clipboard and everything where we're pretending to take notes. I think it's all about that kind of psychological wa warfare that we're involved in as we're litigating. Absolutely. Um, so I want to make sure we get to this last question um, from one of our attendees. It says, once you plead intersectional discrimination, how do you prevent a fact finder from analyzing discrimination separately by protected class, i.e. is there evidence of race discrimination? Is there evidence of gender discrimination? Instead of looking at the discrimination 
um, intersectionally or the totality of the discrimination. Um, and then it says, i.e. this happened uh, because I am a black woman. I mean, I, I think um, the, the framing of the question assumes that we can prevent it, right? And so, you know, all of this, the, our conversation right now is um, one, I guess, of the strategy and ultimately of hope because our, our plaintiff's um, justice rests in the hands of the judge, right? They decide how they wanna interpret the claim and there isn't anything really baked in the law to say that they, they have to look at it through an intersectional lens. The very language of Title VII has it, the word or, which means they can choose to look at one or the other. Um, I think what we've been talking about relating to from the very beginning, making it clear that this is not a, a, you know, an or situation and throwing it all out there, it's, it's because this person is black, it's because this person is woman and it's because this person is a black woman. And then telling the story from that vantage point and having the evidence to support that throughout the summary judgment stage is what's important. I, I believe that advocacy is our biggest strength in this, right? And we have to do it both orally and we have to do it in a written fashion. And the words that we choose to describe our plaintiffs makes a huge difference in how the judges will understand what we're trying to say. It's easy to say, oh yeah, no, the, this is because the person is black. No, the claim is because the person is a black woman and we need to emphasize that at every stage from the very first pleading through the end. Yes, I mean, I, I would echo what Yvette said. You may not be able to prevent it, but I think you can do as much as you can to set it up um, correctly with, you know, if your situation does involve stereotyping, you know, then some of those stereotypes are particular to black women versus just women or just people of color. Um, and that's one way to help, you know, push the issue that this isn't about one or the other, it's about both. There are some circuit cases that deal with sex plus and race plus. Um, and so I would definitely, you know, if that's your situation, you know, pull every case you can um, that talks about that being allowed under Title VII. The other thing I would say to really think about is so much of our case law, all these appellate cases that we're citing to end up in front of these justices on summary judgment, right? And so like the prevalence and the, um, you know, all of the, the good cases, so to speak, went on to trial and they don't ever hear about them. And so their lens a lot of times I think is colored by the fact that what they're seeing are cases that were the most subtle or the most difficult to bring. Um, and that, that makes judges think about how prevalent this stuff is or how it happens in a particular way. Um, and so that's just something to know as you're putting forward your you know, response to a summary judgment motion. Like if there's any way that you can bring in that sort of information about how prevalent this is um, that can contradict some of that bias that's kind of built into the way our jurisprudence works. You know, the, the pellet cases are gonna be those ones where it was something that was denied on summary judgment. And so um, that's just another thing to think about as you're going through the process. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the article, Elizabeth, is you can, it's all in the, in the article evidence of how prevalent this is. Um, Absolutely, and I would encourage people to read um, Joan's article. It's really wonderful. Go ahead, Joan. Just two, two really quick points. Um, one is um, about mistakes. One of the particular uh, findings that we have about Black women is that often they feel like they can't make a single mistake. Um, but the part of the prove it again pattern is that mistakes are more costly for some groups than others. So that's a very important form of evidence. Also a super subtle one is we've just done a um, analysis of performance evaluations. And we find that people of color are much more likely than white people to be described as well-liked and always ready to travel. 
that basically shows that um, yeah, that uh, people of color have to use sort of racial comfort strategies to make sure that white people are always comfortable with them and they never have any hard edges. So um, you wouldn't think of that as evidence of stereotyping, but it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know we have to wrap up soon, but there is one really great question um, that I think ties into another point um, that was made by a uh, attendee. The question says, can you speak to how you handle white defense attorneys who invalidate and undermine your client during depositions? I prep my clients um, that the, the worse they are, the more it will backfire in front of a jury. I call that out in non-employment cases, but when it's the crux of the employment claims, I struggle with allowing more harm to client versus legal strategy. I have experienced that, so I'll take it. Uh, I think two things, invoke the court's assistance when you need to. Mm -hmm. One guy was so crazy, so outrageous, so racist, and disrespectful to me, the defense lawyer is what I'm referring to, I threatened to get on the phone with the judge to have a conference about his behavior and or when he refused to produce a, a, a deponent to be deposed, I threatened him with a motion to compel and I did get a conference with the judge and the judge miraculously, because it was so bad, admonished his behavior. I also think you have to make a record on your record. It's your transcript that's being made. You hired the court reporter. Make sure the court reporter understands that and that unless you say stop tape, the tape is rolling in terms of this person's bad behavior. The last thing I'll say is once it was clear that he was never gonna shape up and, and behave himself, I even suggested that the next deposition would be videotaped but we settled before that happened. I'm saying expose them and don't accept the bad behavior. Do not, I have, I have a security person with me in situations where I think that it's gonna be particularly ugly. I have uh, my private investigator comes to the deposition just in case there are problems. That's how bad it's been with some of these folks who just won't give up this notion that you know black folks are still in chains. They won't give up the fact that slavery supposedly has been abolished and they continue to act out and, and cut up in these depositions. We can't, we can't allow it at trial. We can't allow it in depositions on phone calls. We have to insist on so-called civility. And if we have to be civil, then they have to be civil. And we have to reject the notion that, that we have to be civil and they don't because that's just giving way to the double standard. Thank you, Jaribo. Um, we are seven minutes over time. Um, I just wanted to thank each of our presenters and the Times Up Legal Defense Fund for hosting this webinar. It's been a pleasure to unpack some of these very complex um, but important issues with all of you. I really do wish we had more time, but um, Jennifer and Time's Up, maybe that's an invitation for a second <laughs> iteration of this conversation. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you so much for lending um, your knowledge and your time. It has been wonderful. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Simone. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Bye, everyone.